All right, I think we are on stage. Mm -hmm. Let's check it out. Let's see whether people are joining. Hi guys, hello everyone. Please let us know you hear us, you see us, everything is okay. Just, uh, yeah, the chat. Um, we can uh, go back to our nice tradition sending hellos from different countries or cities so that we know how global we are. Mark, you got you got hearts. <laughs> hearts and smiles. It's uh, always a pleasure to see uh, familiar faces here. Guys, thanks for your support. So, um, as always, we would wait a couple more minutes, just a few more minutes, so that everyone who actually wanted to join us had this chance. Okay, let us first enjoy the, the geographical um, coverage of our webinar today. We have India and UK and Ireland and Helsinki, Cape Town. Wow, hello. Ravi, yeah. how early did you get up in the United States to be here? <laughs> it's like what? Singapore. Wow. Wow. That's what I thought. Poland, Krakow, <laughs> France, Scotland, Spain, Ukraine, Edinburgh, Vienna, Sweden, London, Delft, Hamburg, Krakow, India. Unbelievable. That's really cool. Malta. Budapest, Hungary, Yona Pot Kivana. Yes, now we need to, to, to try all, all the languages that we know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, guys, um, so it's Yulia from Amazing Hiring here and our dearest Mark Lundgren uh, on the other side of Europe. Um, so as it's a Q&A webinar, obviously we've done our homework, we've prepared, mm -hmm. Actually, we have this list of questions that we are dying to ask Mark so that he shares his uh, wisdom and experience with all of us. However, it's a Q&A session. So everyone can also participate and ask your own questions to Mark. Um, so I would recommend you to, uh, to do it in the questions uh, section. Because when you do it in chat, it's easy to lose um, the question. So uh, you see the chat, you see the question button. If you have a question to mark, please go to the questions, um, add your question. By the way, other people can actually upvote it. So if you guys feel that's an amazing question, we should not miss it, uh, add your likes. Um, and we would uh, try to, you know, combine questions from, from us, from Amazing Hiring, and your own questions, okay? We want to really run it as a social uh, social event, social webinar, crowdsource the questions. By the way, big thank you to Jan, um, who was actually the author of this concept uh, once we were chatting about that. So that's, that's your chance to, to ask Mark really anything. I hope anything. If you have any taboo questions, let us know in advance, Mark. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think we are good to go. So um, the theme and the topic of our today's webinar is how do I source the candidates? And that's the question that we want to ask Mark. We really want want to know um, his hands-on uh, advice and experience. So, um, well, first of all, I think all of you guys um, do already know Mark, at least from watching his uh, Sourcing Challenge show, which is an amazing YouTube show featuring uh, sources from all over the world, from different companies uh, that Mark runs. So it's a pleasure for me to have you on the other side, let's say, uh, today. 
Um, well, Mark, if you can just tell us a little bit more about yourself, maybe for those people who do not know you or just know not a lot about you, about your background, how you actually came to the point of where you are right now. Okay, sure. So yes, well, thank you very much for, for having me on. Um, yes, very going very far back. So originally I was born in Denmark. Um, I spent the first 25 years of my life. Um, I joined the recruitment industry in a kind of convoluted way. Um, I, I worked for a student organization at university who did traineeships all over the world. So very much um, getting foreigners into our, our hometown to kind of have traineeships in local companies. And, and our kind of job was to one, select those people that would go from our university to uh, to traineeships and, and two, to find the companies that would would actually have these traineeships. So that's how I got started with very, very back when, uh, 2001. Um, yeah, 18 years in the industry. Um, I switched to specializing in sourcing about five years ago. Um, I finished a, a, a job where I was a 360 recruiter with Amazon um, and realized that one thing I was really bad at was the, was the sourcing piece. So I kind of forced myself to take the next job in a company where the job was about sourcing so I could learn and, and force myself to become better. So that was five years ago. Uh, and I've kind of continued working on that. Um, been lucky to find some mentors that I could learn from. Um, I'd speak a lot with people from around the world and, and learn from, from people who are better at different aspects of sourcing, sourcing than me. Um, and that's very much what I continue doing. Um, speaking, training, um, mentoring and finding people that I can learn from, but also that I can, can kind of teach things in terms of sourcing. So that's very much shortly about me. Okay, cool, cool, thank you. Like from my perspective, when, when I talk to Mark, it's just, I think he knows like everything about any company in the world. So that's, that's just always amazing. So uh, thanks for, for sharing, um, sharing your experience. So. Uh, guys, I, I see already you've answered a lot of questions. Cool, please uh, do not stop. But let's start with a little bit more general um, questions because obviously, Mark, you've mentioned you've been sourcing for the last like five, six years. So, and if I understand correctly, mainly it's IT and tech, right? Or if not, just correct me if I'm wrong. So for IT and tech, what resources are your uh, primary primary um, yeah i mean it's uh, it very much depends so it, it, like with everything else in sourcing it depends where those people are that i'm looking for so even if it's in tech and it um you know that could very much depend which is it's a lot of the times that's kind of the first step for me to find out like hey, where, what are we looking for where would these people normally hang out um, mm -hmm. So obviously a lot of IT and tech people, depending on kind of how specialized they are, would be the likes of GitHub, Stack Overflow, whatever kind of social network you have around the, the coding piece and answering questions. Um, so to be honest, I don't use a lot of resources um, in terms of actually identifying. So obviously Amazing Hiring is one of the main things that I use, uh, mainly because I don't have to go to each of the individual kind of social networks or code repositories. Uh, you know, whether I'm looking at the likes of Meetup, which is what I do a lot to look at, well, if I'm looking for specific people in a specific uh, geography, the first thing I would do is getting people who self-identify as being part of a specific technical group. Um, so with Meetup groups, you have everything from user group for specific programming languages. Uh, like I work with a client now that's specifically in the Microsoft ecosystem. So a lot of that is very much around, you know, Azure, uh, Dynamics, Office 365, the, the Microsoft.NET programming languages and everything around that. Um, so a lot of the times is I might find out on what kind of answers they answer on Stack Overflow or what they have in their code repositories, but a lot of them might have private uh, repositories so don't really get a lot of information. But knowing that they're part of a user group for Azure or .NET, uh, in a in a meetup group, just being members and then kind of using that to 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 dig further into their company or to that specific meetup group with amazing hiring. That's kind of what I do. But I think for sourcing for me as well, the main resources that I use is for the engagement piece, um, identifying 
identifying isn't really the thing that you spend most of the time on. It's it's using the tools that I then have to get more information about people so that I can best tailor my approach to them when I actually want to talk to them. Um, mm -hmm. So that, you know, that's, that's, that's using the functionality with Amazing Hiring to see what other social networks are they a part of? Do they have a website? Do they have a portfolio I can look at? Have they written articles that I can get something out of? Like what's the kind of hook that I can use to get them to actually um, either read my email, if, if it's an email I send, or what kind of information can I use on, uh, on me sending a video to them? And I, I can come back to kind of what I do with video. Right. Okay, um, we have a couple of questions from uh, from our um, guests today, which are you know in line of this question. So probably I'd uh, uh, pick a few. So we have a few upvoted ones. One from um, Vali Garcia. Um, so uh, apart from LinkedIn, what do you use? So I want to rephrase it and say, do you actually use LinkedIn as a primary source ever? In maybe in which cases? I mean, I use LinkedIn, but for me, LinkedIn is the, the anchor where I can go from. Like, I know that I can come back to that. But a lot of the times, LinkedIn is kind of um, somewhere if I can get there, I know that I can link to other networks. So uh, like both in terms of amazing hiring, having the link between LinkedIn and Twitter uh, or their GitHub profile and even LinkedIn with their uh, Connectify social links, having links to other social networks that that person will be on from their LinkedIn profile. Um, so very much using that to see things like, well, this is like their LinkedIn profile. What, where else does that lead me? Um, so that could be, I mean, specifically for technical candidates. What, you know, where's like their Twitter profile? Who do they follow? Uh, what are they tweeting about? Is there anything I can kind of get out of that? Again, to either get a hook or or to find out what kind of groups that they're in that, that I might be able to, to better get an, an understanding of where the interest lies. Okay. So I would, yeah. I would mainly, use, uh, yeah, I would use those tools. Um, I use a meetup a lot. Um, so going in, finding big meetup groups, finding the, the small local meetup groups, um, obviously GitHub Stack Overflow from a, just again, kind of getting information on them. Uh, but um, on a day to day kind of meetup Twitter uh, is my kind of main go-to for technical people, mainly because mm -hmm. it's, it's an easy place to get uh, people to self-identify as being part of a specific group. Mm hmm okay and then Fiona asks do you use custom search engines and yeah can you help with construction affecting ones do, do you use yeah them? not as much as I should uh, I think the 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 only real thing I I actively use custom search engines for uh, Google custom search engines is um, is diversity search for uh, um, for Europe. Um, to be honest, I like fiddling around with uh, with my own Boolean searches. So I, I, I haven't used custom search engines as much in my career, uh, mainly because it's I actually like fiddling around and starting from scratch every time. Um, mm -hmm. Also, because I, I, I don't I don't take the time to actually build my own engine. And if I haven't seen how the custom search engine is built, I don't know what criteria is in there. Um, right. So when I use them, I rather build it on my own because then I know, like I know what filters I can push on and off, which is also why I like writing my own boolean because, like I then know if their mistake is my mistake. Uh, if I haven't written it, I don't know if I'm limiting myself to something I don't necessarily want to limit. Um, so uh, we all have our different way of searching. I think like people using amazing hiring is the same thing. Um, some people like to be very narrow and they end up with two results. Um, I like going as, as broad as possible to begin with and then narrowing it down. Um, so it very much depends on that. Custom search engine is good if you know how to make them. Um, and even if you get them from other people, if you know what, what criteria they put in there. Uh, but since I rarely have the time to actually look into that, I, I just end up using, uh, using Boolean on my own. Um, I don't have a big problem with, uh, with getting results on that. Right, okay. And another, probably in this um, last one, uh, question, which is like highly upvoted, uh, 11 people support this question uh, from Adrian. What are your favorite tools and by what approach do you see the highest response rate of contacting candidates? Yeah, so um, 
in terms of tools, actually my favorite tools is the ones that let me attach videos into emails. Um, so I mainly use two. I've used a number of ones over time. Um, what is called Loom, which is a free one, and it's been out for a while. It lives in the browser as a Chrome plugin and mainly works with uh, Gmail. Uh, lets you shoot a, a video straight in the browser, put it as part of the email, and send it off. Uh, another one is called Vidyard, which both works for, again, it's a Chrome plugin, but it works for both Gmail and Outlook. Mm -hmm. uh, same idea. Um, you shoot a video, you put it in the email, and send it off. Um, and that is the highest response rate I've gotten. So it doesn't take me longer than it would to customize a, you know, a template that I would anyway. O honestly, it doesn't take me longer than it would to send an email, sure. um, because once you get used to it, like doing a one-minute, you know, one-minute video takes you maybe two minutes to finish. It takes you one minute to shoot the video, and then it takes you one minute to make sure it's a, uh, it's in the email. So I, you might want to put some buffer text and a call to action, and so like, look. Instead of writing you a long email, um, I did this video for you, you know, and then putting my kind of call to actions, like, do you have 15 minutes for us to talk? Here's my calendar link. Pop in the video and sending it off. Uh, doing 20 of them a day takes maybe half an hour, even if it's, you know, very beginning and you're kind of conscious about video, might take you an hour. But right. the response rate, instead of getting, you know, a 10% positive response rate, which is what I normally get for tech candidates, I get a lot more, you know, people actually, because they appreciate that you've done something different mm -hmm. and it feels very personal. Even if I use a template, like, you know, my, my kind of story bit in the beginning and my call to action are all the same. I, I've customized the middle bit, but even if I did that in an email, I wouldn't get that kind of response, but doing it in a video, mm -hmm. it makes it personal because it's to them. I use their name. I talk about their experience and, uh, and they don't, you know, it's not a template that they that they know I put you know whatever placeholders into and just ran it to a, a, a outreach program. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So we have the name of those two tools for outreach in in the chat. Um, so going uh, forward, I mean, you've partially answered that question probably already. Social sourcing. How do you understand that? And um, is yeah, I mean, it, it, it very much the whole kind of social thing, social sourcing, social recruiting, social sales, like yeah. So I, because I started back in two thousand and one, we were still sending faxes to people and uh, and following up on even sending a fax was new. Following up on the phone and everything was on the phone in the beginning. Um, so everything kind of social. I mean, I I joined LinkedIn two thousand and four. Um, I think I'm 341,000 uh, person who joined LinkedIn. Um, so, you know, that's how new in, in the greater scheme of things that LinkedIn is. It's only 15 years ago that I joined it. Um, so, and it was very American, like nobody thought about using it as a recruitment and not, I didn't either. It was just, it was a, it's an interesting social network I read about in a Wired magazine. Um, and, and, you know, today it's 99% it's, you know, of all recruiters, that's the main tool that they use. Uh, okay. which it can be good and bad. Um, but it's very much that kind of moving from away from, you know, where we were advertising, getting people to send CVs, putting things in, pa in the paper, uh, and cold calling to everything is around social. As you know, you reach out to people, you connect with people, you kind of, uh, you use that. Um, it's popular because it's easy to scale, I think. Um, some of it is just us being lazy. Um, and it's much, you know, it's much easier just to send an email to all the 200 people that that remotely covers a keyword than than spending a little more time on on doing research. You know, way back when we were still calling, calling through, and making sure it's like, you know, call everybody in this company because one of them should be a right person, uh, or you know, go through our ATS, our CRM, and see like everybody who has ever applied for a role like this starts calling through, and you know, that's what we did. So. It was very much that kind of thing. So it's 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 popular because it's easy and you can do it from anywhere in the world. Um, it doesn't have the barrier of entry that phones used to do, where you know if you if you're calling from halfway around the world, like you, you can see the number is different. It's the phone bills are high. Like I started in telesales and you know working for a company with a million dollar phone bill every year. So you know you don't have that kind of thing. Even even LinkedIn being as expensive as it is. I, that's still nothing compared to what we used to spend in phone bills for cold calling people. Okay. Um, 
I'd say like uh, again when when you uh, describe how it was a little bit like uh, five or ten years ago, uh, and that's that's so much similar to sales, and the evolution is uh, so much like similar, maybe a little bit uh, in some terms. Uh, one industry is ahead at some point of time, but then they are like very much synchronized. Um, social sourcing tools. I mean, again, yeah. If 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 you, if you yeah, uh, yeah. For me, for me, it's very much about so like the tools that I use. Um, it used to be very much about finding people's email addresses. Um, mm -hmm. It's less and less that. Not that I don't want them, but just from a GDPR point of view, it's like I want to make sure that if I get them, I get them from open sources, which uh, very much limits the number of companies you can work with, which is why I like working with Amazing Hiring as well, because it's it's very clear if there's an email address from somebody that I'm looking at using the tool, where mm -hmm. that email address comes from. And I know I can go back and I can find the email address as like on my own, if I had to, to show like to show as well. Um, yeah. And if a candidate asks where I have the email address from, I can tell them. So the main tools that I use is to find out more information about people. Like as I said, you know, using amazing hiring, using uh, connected via social links to get other social profiles. So do they have a website? Do they have a medium uh, post? Are they doing blogs? Are they on Twitter? What meetup groups are they in? Uh, you know what are they kind of, you know, what are they kind of doing other than just what's on their LinkedIn or their GitHub, GitHub or Stack Overflow? Like what mm -hmm. other things are they interested in and, and what are they about? What's the kind of hook that I can use to get them to see that you know I've actually looked into them and it's not just because they they fit a keyword, but I've looked into what companies that they're with and and something interesting about them that that interested me to talk to them about. Right, and then our next question is uh, pretty much logical in uh, uh, the lines of what you just said, because that, that means a lot of personification, that means a lot of research. So how much time does it actually take if we put uh, quality over quantity? I mean, most of my time goes on researching. Um, so I, I, my time is split up into kind of three, mainly because I work with a client that has a lot of meetings. So I spend a third of my times in meetings with, you know, with other things other than kind of directly related to sourcing. So that mm -hmm. could be recruitment marketing, uh, training teams on sourcing, just giving input on different kind of uh, market mapping exercises, working with different teams we have. Um, a third or maybe more of that is going on the research piece. So very much finding out and that's, you know, finding the people generating the list, but also looking into competitors companies. It's like, where, you know, who do they have? Where are their people coming from? Where are their people going to? Uh, it's, a, it's a specific, you know, how do they map in terms of the experience level with the titles they have compared to what we have or other companies? Um, and then a third on, uh, you know, contacting people, following up on people, um, call like having calls with people, talking to recruiters to kind of, you know, to hand them over to, to them. Um, so that's very much my kind of split. So yeah, like two thirds, uh, probably more is of my time is on what I might deem as sourcing. Um, the rest of it is, is, you know, just working in a company and doing all the team meetings and calls and things like that, that you have to get done. Okay. And uh, you actually answer the next question. <laughs> so we can, uh, we, we can actually, uh, uh, have a look at, at the questions from uh, our lovely guest today and there are a few ones about like sourcing on different platforms like for example Fiona asks can you explain how do you search on github how, how do you find the right repositories Eugene uh, hello Eugene um, asks about like talent, finding talents on Twitter what exactly do you do and then uh, yeah uh, Tush Aitush um, asks about have you tried sourcing through Slack channels? So, so yeah, um, I, I'll, I'll start with I'll start with two. Um, so, I wouldn't necessarily source people through ch Slack channels as such. Um, I have used uh, the kind of thing of um, going in, joining a Slack channel, but with my corporate uh, emails, uh, like specifically, you know, I, I work for a Microsoft uh, technology um, uh, company. So, you know, the Slack channels that actually are relevant to the Microsoft technologies using that, um, getting, you know, getting the information about what people are in there. 
Um, I wouldn't do a private kind of channel in Slack channel mainly because it's like that's not what it's for. Uh, it's a bit like finding people on Facebook. I wouldn't necessarily, you know, I wouldn't send them a friend request. I might send them a Facebook Messenger request, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the fact that I found their information on Facebook to reach out to them. Um, right. I might feed, I might find somebody on a Slack channel that again, it's a, it's a self identification in a specific uh, niche. Um, so know that they're in there and use whatever information I find on their profile on Slack to find them in other places that I can then use to reach out to them. Um, and you had the one with uh, Twitter somewhere as well from Eugene. Um, so for me, it's about um, finding people who are following some of the, the thought leaders. Um, so last year I worked for, for ThoughtWorks and it was very much anything about, you know, agile and uh, clean code and um, uh, you know, those kinds of things. So a lot of the kind of a lot of the, the thought leaders that had either used to work with uh, with ThoughtWorks and uh, like things like uh, you know uh, containerizing and things. Everybody was kind of talking about their same thing. So I knew that by we knew by by looking at who's following those people. Um, you know that's the people who are most likely to be interested in in us when we actually approach them. Uh, because they're following somebody who's connected to ThoughtWorks or used to be connected with ThoughtWorks and had had a kind of link to that. Um, so that's what I'm doing now as well. Like obviously with the Microsoft ecosystem, it's um, it's it's looking at people who are following the MVPs within the Microsoft system. So uh, you know people who don't necessarily work for Microsoft, but they're specialists within a specific field. Um, so an MVP in Dynamics 365 and people following that person will be somebody that most likely is interesting for me. Uh, whether it says directly on their profile that they're interested in, in, in the Microsoft Data system or not, but it gives me a, a kind of signal that I can use to research further. Um, I wouldn't necessarily contact them on Twitter first, but it's definitely part of my follow-up strategy. Um, so if I send them an email and then an email or the other way around, um, I would always uh, go in and like if I can find them on Twitter, I would follow them on Twitter or like something they tweeted that has relevance to what I'm talking with them about. Um, but finding different, so like the reason for me as well is using as many social profiles as possible is having different venues that I can follow up on. Uh, if I send them an, an email first with a video, I would always follow up with you know something else that isn't a video, like, but like text only because you never know. Um, you know, following them on Twitter, liking them, whatever it is to kind of to stay in top of mind and also just using different channels to get to follow up with people um, and then kind of following up that way. So that would be in, in terms of Twitter. Um, mm -hmm. um, in terms, yeah, Fiona was asking about GitHub. Um, I don't as much, mainly because I don't have to. I mean, I have amazing hiring. I can go in and uh, the search that I kind of do I can I can ask Amazing Hiring just to limit that to GitHub, um, and I mean what the limitations with GitHub. What you end up actually searching is their ranking in terms of how many stars they have. So other people have start their repositories, um, and I kind of rely on both the star ranking, but also in in terms of like are they the the top whatever percent uh, in terms of stars in that specific programming language because of what 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 that specific repository is written in. Um, I used to use a site called Git Awards, uh, which is a similar kind of thing. Uh, it goes in, it uses the API from, from, from GitHub um, to look at who are the top users in a specific country for a specific programming language or a specific city for a specific programming language. And that's a way you can go in as well and kind of look at Stack Overflow has the same thing where you can go in and you can see you know, the, top, the, the top answers of questions in a specific uh, technology. Uh, so for Stack Overflow, that's tax in a specific country or in a specific city. But with Amazing Hiring, I don't have to do that because I can ask them to do it because you know it's already mapped that way. Mm -hmm. Cool. And I think also in line of what we've discussed, um, Kasia actually um, has a great question because we have a lot of a lot of platforms, a lot of tools, instruments. But um, how important is the strategy? And uh, what's what's the plan from what to start? Yeah. And also, um, Mark asks, what's like is email is a good first approach channel or cold calling or WhatsApp? And I think this is also about the strategy. So like, how to work out what's the best? Exactly. I mean, it's a strategy for me. It's about uh, working with the recruiter, working with the hiring manager. Um, 
to find out what works, but also to research. Like I, I, I do global roles, so I can put as many things into a process that's the same. That being said, uh, I'm working on like I'm working. I'm working in a framework of what we did in ThoughtWorks last year. So we we start very much start doing agile sourcing. So it is very much kind of like it's a template for how we work. So uh, it's very clear about when we do what and in what kind of sequence and what we do. Um, so in terms of the strategy, I, I don't make a specific strategy for everything. I make a strategy for me and my team to kind of find out like we know what we're doing. It's like it's the same thing every time. We, we identify the people we want to talk to. Uh, we get them qualified with either the manager or the, the, the recruiter. It's like the, are these people that we want to interview if we get them to be, to want to talk to us? Um, and then we, f we we have a look at like where would these people hang out? Where are the most likely places that we will find these people? What are the tools we need to 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 get them in those uh, in those specific you know social networks or wherever that is? Um, how do we reach out to them? How do we follow up with them? What works the best? Uh, what's up? I, I wouldn't necessarily use as the first. I, when at all possible, I always use email as the first uh, the first outreach, um, and that's that's mainly from a personal ref, uh, preference. Um, mm -hmm. I don't I don't like being cold called. Um, so even though I I used to be a telemarketer and I used to do a lot of cold called, um, I don't like doing that. And it's also working in a lot of countries where that just won't work. I mean, try to call somebody in Poland with a mobile phone, you're mo most likely not going to pick up. Um, and, and it's like, it's just the reality of like, I'm not going to pick up anybody I don't know. So if they're not coded in my phone, which is very few people, then I'm not picking up. If I get an email, even if I get a Facebook messenger request, it's more likely that I'm going to, you know, that I'm going to actually answer that. And, you know, that's kind of what it is. So email is always my prefer preference. Uh, email with video is more and more my preference now so, because it, it just gives that more personality. It's like I'm not just sending an email that I sent to a million other people. Um, I'm sending you an email with a video. Um, I use um, I use a call a tool called Lemlist in terms of uh, follow up sequence. Um, so even if I have sent emails to you know if if over a week I've sent video emails to a hundred people, um, I don't necessarily want to have to follow up manually with all of them. So my okay. follow-up email, you know, I will do that to uh, to Lemdis, so I can I can make sure like if they click, if they reply, things like that, that that's all in a that, that that's all tracked, and I don't have to kind of do that manually every time. But I have, I mean, I've I've been and I've I've been up all night to kind of schedule hundreds of emails to go out because I wanted to make sure they went out at the right time and that it was personalized and the right videos was in there. So and what about WhatsApp? Everyone is on their phones. Oh. Yes. Um, so absolutely. I mean, I love. I know most people were panicking when Facebook said that they were gonna they were gonna merge WhatsApp and and uh, Facebook Messenger. I personally love it because uh, you know ninety percent of the communication that I have with other recruiters uh, around the world is on Facebook and and uh, and, and Facebook Messenger. Uh, more and more on WhatsApp, but that specific people again. Uh, Messenger, I don't need their phone number. Uh, WhatsApp, I do. So you know, it's it's again that kind of, it's that opt-in kind of thing. I love Facebook Messenger because one, it lives on the phone. Uh, you know, 1.5 billion people have it on their phone, and it for most people pop up because they haven't switched off notifications. Um, so you know that even if you're not connected with this person, you get one really good chance to get to make an impression. And guess what? Like you can record a, a video on your phone. So the first thing you do with Facebook Messenger on people is to pop in a video. Um, look, you know, people don't have to accept you, but at least they're going to have seen the video. So if you do a, a good first impression, uh, even if they don't accept you as they don't accept you as a Facebook friend, it's just a Facebook Messenger uh, connection. But you have you know, you, you have an opt in for them to kind of continuing talking to you. Um, so yeah, whenever I can, I would use a video for that, or you know, a, at least kind of a, a voicemail, a voice message on that. So it's not just what looks like a standard kind of message. Uh, it's 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 an amazing advice. I remember once uh, Katrina Katrina Collier asked everyone in the room during her presentation to record and send her the video, and that was <laughs> when I actually did that. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Okay, so um, tactile and core thing. Well, I guess that's uh, that's a question that does not really require an answer. Um, however, if we look at the entry level candidates, 
Um, are there any difference? They're, they're actually higher. Um, so because a lot of the kind of entry level candidates, they don't have a large social footprint. Well, they might have, but you know, they don't have something that's been interesting for us. Um, yeah. Because they're entry level, they're not going to be in a lot of meetup groups. They just joined. Uh, they don't have a they. They might have a little bit of uh, code on the repositories, but it's mainly from you know whatever they've kind of done in their education or boot camps or whatever it is. Um, mm -hmm. So actually, sourcing entry level candidates, from my point of view, has been the hardest thing. Um, I'm lucky enough to actually work on the kind of experience and senior level, so I don't have to wreck my brain too much. Um, but like, kind of from experience, it's very much about reaching out more on based on what universities do they go to? Have they written anything about, you know, what 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 studies they have uh, using conferences as much as possible? Because they will generally go to, you know, the, the kind of conference, the, you know, the women in tech, that kind of thing. You'll have a lot of that kind of new people in tech. Uh, kind of conferences, events, meetups, that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, university recruitment, I'm, I'm glad I'm not in it anymore. Um, but it ha like that has been a, a kind of hard thing. But like at, at the end of the day, like that's one of the ones that are relatively easy to find on LinkedIn because they haven't actually been scared away yet by millions of emails. Um, as like in the more senior and especially the you know, very senior people on in terms of tech have been. Um, so like you still get a lot of you know easier um, easier wins from from entry level people from a LinkedIn point of view. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I, I mean the difference in approach isn't necessarily that big. Um, I would try to as much as possible to get in early. You know, if you know that you're hiring a lot of kind of entry level university graduates, uh, use that and and kind of build over time. So invite them before they graduate. Uh, invite you know the whole kind of years of making sure like when they start or in the middle of their education get them get them invited to events get them to meet up so do events with the universities or with the with the coding schools and the boot camps and things like that so your kind of company gets top of mind for them um, so that you know you you're not competing at the same level as everybody else once they graduate because then it's a free for all um, so get in there and and as a, as a somebody that that gives back to the community and that wants the best for them. Um, because that's kind of like, you know, that's what we used to do just from a kind of, you know, student organization part. It was being in there early. So by the time they were ready to actually go on a traineeship, they knew who we were. Um, right. So that, you know, we, we were top of mind for them. Credit recruitment market is very tough. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I also come from the credit recruitment as my first, first career. So, yeah um mark um you've mentioned a lot of different tools and strategies and we've discussed various ways on how to connect and reach out uh to a candidate and um we have a question here what's the right moment to ask the passive candidate for a resume but i would a little bit rephrase it maybe and if you can just share with us like this ideal candidate journey um that you create as a recruiter and at some point of time you probably would ask or maybe you wouldn't so how does it actually look like i mean it, for, for me it very much depends if i don't have to or rather not um and that's just from like i don't have a resume i haven't had one for four years um because it's generally like i am a recruiter if you want to see what i've done in my in the past look at my linkedin profile that is my resume um yes i could write a lot more but it's like if if you really need that, then like have a conversation with me instead. Um, so I try not to ask. Like if I can get away with it, I, I don't want to ask um, because it's like if, especially if they've been through me and they're passive. They're you know they were passive before we kind of contacted them. It's like it's it's a it's a barrier to get them on in the process. So generally, when you talk to somebody, they're they're, they're not looking for a job, which is what really makes them passive. And the conversation I have is not, I have this opportunity, do you want it? The conversations that I have is, you know, this is this is the team I'm working with. Let me tell you their story very shortly. But I, what I really want to know is, what would you be looking for if you were going to do your next kind of career step? What would need to be in that role? Uh, what would you like to, you know, to continue doing that you have in your current role? Um, and then I, like, I'll take a call on whether I think we already have that. And one of the roles that I'm working on would, would be that kind of opportunity. 
uh, mm -hmm. if I think we'll have that in the next six or 18 months. So, so that I can say, look, I think we'll get this. Can I give you a call when, when that role comes up with a view to you possibly interviewing for it? Or just be honest with them and say, look, what you're looking for, we, we, that's not what we do. And I don't think we'll be right. So don't want to waste your time. Um, but if I can see that there's something there and it's like, look, I have a role that, that fits, you know, 90% of what you just told me you would be looking for. Would you be, would you be up for doing, you know, an interview with my recruiter or my manager? I don't necessarily want to ask for that. And it, it very much depends on kind of what my feel with the candidate is. Um, it could be, it's like, if I'm in a company where that's an absolutely, you know, it has to be a resume or then I'll work on that. And, and I'll normally, the way I'll normally ask is like, look, would you mind, like, do you have a resume that you could send me uh, or, you know, that kind of thing. And if they say, look, I, I don't have one, but I can work on one. I'm like, look, you know, whenever you have time, but I would still put them through and, and get them interview with the, if I'm handing it off to a recruiter, it's generally not a, a problem. Some managers are a bit old fashioned and they absolutely want a resume. The companies that I've worked with in the last couple of years, it's not really a priority because they really want the talk anyway. Like they're, they're looking for a few things and we'll generally have covered that in between my kind of my, my sourcing kind of sales call and the recruiter screen with that candidate of, have you worked with this technology to what level uh, that kind of, you know, whatever it is with kind of the knockout questions, which is what they normally look for in a, in a resume, we would have covered off. And mm -hmm. my research for having reached out to them in the first place, like I wouldn't have, we wouldn't have reached out to them unless we already knew that they were likely to be somebody that we want to work with. And I've already worked with the manager and the recruiter to qualify the people before we've done the first contact. Uh, we try to as much as possible to make sure that the, the, the list of people we want to contact has been something that we asked the manager and the recruiter to say, like, if we get these people interested in talking to us, will you interview them? Because um, then we don't have that kind of hand of failure point where it's like, we think it's a perfect candidate and the recruiter takes three weeks and then said, nah, that wasn't what we were looking for. We have that buy-in to begin with. Okay. Okay, cool. And uh, the last question from Amazing Karen, and uh, we will uh, move to, to all the other questions. We have um, quite many. So, um, the sourcing budget, do you, um, do you have to think about it? Or maybe in your role, it's not always, uh, yeah. Uh, very much depends. So, uh, I'm lucky enough to be a freelancer, so I can answer this question in, in two different ways. So, mm -hmm. personally, yes. Um, I budget my sourcing based on time and obviously technology cost. Uh, from a company point of view, I'm building up a sourcing team now as well for a client. Um, some of it is is fixed cost technology cost, but a lot of it as well is is about finding out like, you know, most of the time it's about where do we get this budget from? Because the least like very few companies actually have a budget specifically for sourcing. Uh, mainly, and I, I think Balash put an article that, about that. Uh, he, there was an article on SourceCon, I think, yesterday or the day before yesterday, on exactly that. It's like if you're only selling sourcing as a standalone discipline to your company, you'll probably not get the budget. What you really need to start positioning, um, and I, I was talking to Tris Revel about this as well this week, is what else that we do as a sourcing. So we're doing market mapping, we're doing competitive intelligence. Like when we have those talk with, with candidates, we're getting information about competitors, about what's going on in the industry. Uh, a lot of the time we're, we're helping on employment branding, on making better job ads, on you know doing, doing the marketing piece. Like a lot of what we do, like we forget to actually mention when it comes to getting money. Um, but when we start like mapping out all of that and what we actually spend our time on and why we're helping, well, we're helping the company, um, like, you know, we start going into, we're not just something that like, like that helps recruitment. Uh, you know, we could get part of marketing budget. We could, you know, get part of uh, whatever employment branding there is. Uh, a lot of the times we, you know, we, we help sales because we actually get competitor information that you wouldn't in a kind of marketing or sales point of view because we we kind of getting information from people who either used to work for our competitor or is currently working for our competitor, uh, you know, without being kind of things they shouldn't have said. But we just get a better feel for for those companies that we can share with our salespeople, our marketing people as well, and help them with that. 
Um, absolutely, and I think that's very important. I hear that every day. I think that uh, yeah, the budget question is a big question out there, and uh, well, we need to we need to help and uh, spread this awareness uh, more on uh, like how and why sourcing team needs to have their own instruments and what's the value and what's the return on investment um, because it's still like sometimes a gray zone um, for for many many teams. Okay, so um, questions. Um, I will, uh, I'll take the top one that I can see. So uh, Evelyn asked if LinkedIn Recruiter is a standard uh, standard kit for any sourcer or is it old news? Um, mm -hmm. You know, like, LinkedIn Recruiter is nice to have. When I'm ever with a client that's gonna pay for it, I'm happy about it. Cause it's kind of, especially like I work in enterprises for most of the time. Um, you know, the recruiters that I work with will work in LinkedIn Recruiter, uh, like the company I'm with now, a lot of the managers have it. That being said, I personally only pay for a sales navigator account. Uh, and that's for two things. Like I don't need LinkedIn Recruiter to do what I do. Uh, you know, amazing hiring. It's it's not just a tool that, you know, because they're, they're doing this webinar, um, whenever I do tech and technologies, like I don't need to use LinkedIn Recruiter for it. LinkedIn Recruiter is good for corporations with teams that use LinkedIn Recruiters, but it's mainly because the recruiters, that's the only tool that they know, not because the sources. Uh, I, if I need a CRM, which is, you know, the, the piece that people use LinkedIn Recruiter for, I'll use, you know, thing like Hello Talent so I can share the, the project with, with like external managers or with a company I work with. Um, if I'm lucky enough to be in a team that has amazing hiring, that's the whole team. I don't need the, 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 the projects in LinkedIn Recruiter because I can just share the projects that we have in amazing hiring. Um, and then I know if they're looking at a profile in, in uh, whether that's on LinkedIn Recruiter or on LinkedIn, it will show up the notes that we have in that project for the team, who of the team has already looked at this profile. Uh, you know, we would put notes in if we reached out to this person. That would be on the amazing hiring tab on on uh, that pops up on LinkedIn. So I don't I don't necessarily need a LinkedIn recruiter. It's a nice to have, but a lot of the time it's just laziness that that you have it, or uh, the recruiters who don't they don't have time to use anything else. So if you have a pure sourcing team um, and your main thing that you're doing is tech, then you don't need it. Like you you'll get. From a research point of view, you'll get a good good results as well with a sales navigator. Um, in terms of researching into companies and just seeing the seeing the people, but amazing hiring is going to show you you know most of the people you'll find as well. Um, so yeah, you don't necessarily need it. I mean, the money you would spend on a LinkedIn recruiter account for everybody in your team, uh, you can get every tool that I, like that I've ever used at the same price, and you'll still have money left over. Um, and then, I mean, my 60, what is it, $69 a month uh, sales navigator kind of makes up for everything else that, that I'm kind of missing. Um, you know, and, and that's with running lots of plugins that original, like the LinkedIn is, don't necessarily like, um, but I've never been locked down from that point of view. Okay, cool. Um... Another question from Eugene, uh, an interesting one, by the way. Do you send out reaches to company emails? How, can you compare the response rate if you compare with the private emails? Yeah, again, uh, personal choice. I hate sending to company emails, uh, mainly because I hate getting them. Um, so I always, if at all possible, would send it to a private email, uh, even if I think it's an old private email. Um, it would be an absolute last resort, especially in tech. Uh, mm -hmm. It would be a last resort for me to send to a company email. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I don't. I will. I will rather send them a Facebook Messenger request uh, before I will, even if I have their company email, because um, it's just one. I don't like it myself. So in I like very much. That's my kind of compass for that. It, would I like if that was me? Would I like that? And I hate when I get things on my company emails. Um, on, on like especially from a recruitment point of view, so I don't do it personally, and yeah. I, I tell my I tell my teams not to. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, question from Tush um, again, and the good one we've mentioned market research, market intelligence. That's actually this added value that the sourcing mm -hmm. usually gives to to the talent acquisition teams. So, can you recommend any tools, or do you, do you use 
any specific tools for that as well? So at the moment, I'm uh, lucky in that sense that I just got an access to LinkedIn Talent Insights. Right. Uh, it's still a new product for them. Again, it's like LinkedIn Recruiter. It's a nice to have. Um, I uh, even I used to work for Microsoft before we kind of you know, got a lot of that. It's a lot of research about looking into you know using LinkedIn Recruiter or whatever kind of like what 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 looks what seems to be the kind of uh, the, the thing. Um, obviously, with amazing hiring, has a lot of kind of insights. You know, if you've used it and actually clicking on the companies that that you're looking at. Um, I. I use a lot of even the free company lookup on LinkedIn. Look at yeah. um, even if you have like with a sales navigator account, you go in and you look at each specific companies. You can see what their growth in each department is. So I used it a lot. Um, I did my advanced some research last year when I worked for a company on the, the kind of top two thousand um, SaaS companies where their engineering teams were and how much they've grown over the last year. Because you can do that with with like basically a a sales navigator account on LinkedIn, looking at each company, and then you can go down and dig down to what the growth on each uh, each department. So I looked at all the engineering teams, where they were based, uh, and what kind of growth they'd seen in the last six months, a uh, year, two years, because that will give you a kind of like, is this a company that has a high attrition, or uh, you know, are they like they're growing in generally, but the engineering team isn't? Then then that wouldn't necessarily. So that was a lot of kind of manual research. Uh, LinkedIn Talent Insights does a lot of that easier, but again, you're only, it's like with everything else, you're only connected to whatever data LinkedIn has, um, but you know, it's, it's as good as, as, as that kind of is. So yeah, that's what I have at the moment. I, I haven't done a lot of kind of research, uh, market mapping research and things like that, but that's kind of what I have used. Uh, in terms of what we used to use a lot, especially when it comes to kind of salaries and sentiment in general, uh, there's an app called Blind, which is an anonymous chat app for tech companies, um, which gives you a lot of insights to well, a lot of you know, a lot of people talking about what offers they're getting from different tech companies and what they're currently on and what salary level, because there's that anonymous kind of thing. But you still, you know, that it's anonymous, whatever, from Microsoft saying that he's on level 60, whatever. Uh, and this is his salary, and he just got an offer from Uber from this and that. So that just like with all of that kind of information put together, it gives me a lot of information about, you know, what 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 people are kind of on, and we use that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, a question from Dove: How many times do you follow up, Mark? How do you know when enough is enough? <laughs> so again, it depends. Um, if I use email only, um, I've kind of found that when when I followed up three four f three times and I do a fourth, people get annoyed. Um, that's why I'm saying it's like use more channels. So I would generally use emails and I would send three follow ups uh, to the max. But in between those follow ups, I would do you know uh, I would start them on whatever, start their their repository and Slack. I would you know follow uh, follow them on on uh, Twitter. Uh, I might retweet something. I would like one of the medium posts, whatever it is, something mm -hmm. that that you know shows them that that I want to get in contact with them without being like I'm not gonna go in and and you know like every one of their posts so they so that you know so I fill their home feed. But I might retweet a tweet that makes sense for what I'm contacting about or something that I generally think was a you know as was a good post. Uh, I'm not just going to do it to do it, but if, if I can see that they are they are tweeting things that are relevant to the industry that I'm working with, then I'll retweet that. If they wrote a medium post that I honestly think was good, then I'll uh, you know I'll let them know that, or I might actually you know put that on social media as well as something I think people in in the industry that that I'm talking to would would want to read. Mm -hmm. Okay, we don't have much time left, but still <laughs> quite many questions. So let's let's try um, to, to to answer as many as we can. Um, a new question from Marina, and the great one, I believe. Uh, do we have any special approach to get in touch with female engineers? Um, so no, I wouldn't treat them specifically different. Um, uh, same thing, and I mean the videos that I send. Is very much when I do diversity sourcing. So, I, 
yeah, I, I grew up alone with my mom. So I spent most of my life surrounded by women. Um, so it's, it's generally the, the way that I think. Like, but the reason I use a lot of videos as well is because it just makes it more personal. I like, and especially when it comes to female engineers, I like showing them who I am and not kind of be some no name, whatever, behind a profile picture and an email. Um, so I, I, I want them to understand and, and also just like, look, if they like the looks of like, you know, the way that I talk, then, then they know what the phone call with me will be about. Like they don't have to, you know, to worry about, you know, who is this person? And like, is it, you know, is this person really who he say, says he is, or is it just some kind of fake profile and, you know, that's going to do whatever. So that's why I like the video kind of thing. Like they get to see me and, and then decide, like, is this somebody I want to spend 15 minutes on the phone call with or not? Um, plus, I like as much as possible. If I can get a Zoom call set up with people or, you know, a, a team, whatever, it can, if I can get a video call set, set up with them so that it's, I can see, they can see my body language, I can see theirs, I'd rather do that. Um, mm -hmm. And by using video, I kind of, like, I've, I've opened up from my point of view. Um, and it's easier to kind of have that conversation. It's like, look, instead of doing a phone call, do you mind doing, you know, a, a video call instead? Because uh, it just makes it easier to kind of, you know, to talk. Um, and, you know, they, they will then be easier to kind of like, yeah, okay, you know, because you've kind of opened up and you've done it already. But no, I wouldn't necessarily do that different. I'm more likely to use video when I approach female engineers um, than if I do, if I did male only. Um, because I, I just know that it's like I get a lot less chances to to get to to them to reply to me than I would with with necessarily because there's so many more males. Like I know that the female engineers are getting bombarded with uh, emails and emails and you know lots of things that I need to stand out even more when it comes to them. Right. Okay, as um, it's like three minutes till the next hour, depending on where you are, guys, and many of us have some tight schedule. I just want to, you know, finalize uh, things from our point of view and then so that, you know, people who need to run um, can do that. Actually, uh, I'm not sure if there are any people from uh, all of you guys, participants today, who haven't yet have amazing hiring or tried amazing hiring, but from... Um, other from our point of, of view if you haven't ever tested that's a great way to do it so i will just you know um <laughs> come to the promo code yeah so um amazing hiring.com request demo just add the promo code mark lundgren if you have participated in this webinar to make sure that you have an extended trial for three weeks. Best, best promo code ever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. Um, so guys, um, please come. We will show you how it works. We will show you how to change your sourcing in a way that it um, works in a more effective way. So we have a lot of yeah people in the chat a lot so i'm just trying to understand what's going on yeah otherwise i just wanted to uh to come back to a few other questions if you have a few minutes more um and thank you everyone who who participated um yeah i, I actually i really like the question about the employer brand because that's important in, in sourcing and probably that will be the last one so mark uh, do, like for you, the brand of the company where you work, does, is it important? Does it change the way how you source actually? Uh, it changes whether I get easy response or not. Um, it, it doesn't, I mean, unless it's a really bad brand, um, I'd rather work with a company that has no brand than somebody that has a really bad one. Um, mainly because, I mean, my template in terms of how I actually structure my messages, the beginning is always about the team that I'm working with, not the boilerplate that the company has, but, you know, this is the team, this is what they're building, this is what, you know, this is, this is the challenge they have. Uh, then about the person I want, like, that I'm, that I'm reaching out to, it's like, this is what, what stood out on you, this is why we contacted you, that kind of hook, and then my call to action. So for me, it's like, the less, if I have no employer brand, then, I mean, it's up to me to build that. And it's, that, that call that we have, that's very much for me to position it. Like we are the salespeople of the company when it comes to recruitment. So we're the one that kind of, that tells that story. 
So that kind of elevator pitch is the main thing that that the kind of team works on. It's like how do you how do you position the team that you're working with in 30 seconds? Because if I have 15 minutes with a person, I'll sp I want to spend as little time as possible explaining what we do because it's not about us; it's about them, and I want them to tell me what they could be looking for if they were ever looking to make a, a change. Um, so the less time I need to spend on my company, the better. Um, so I, what I use as well is I send as many links to YouTube videos, whatever I kind of can from like, do we have teams presenting the company? Is there something about the role? Is there, you know, blog posts of people working in the team, whatever I can, I'll put that in the emails that I'm sending as well. So it's easy for people to prepare. Um, but I'd rather have a company with no employer brand than somebody with, you know, a really bad one. Because it's harder with a bad one. Uh, you know, you have a lot of questions on that. Right. Yeah. Um, and probably the last question mark. So how many emails in the end of the day do you send daily? Let's let's have some benchmark for all of us. Uh, very much depend. I mean, I was in a role a couple of years ago where I would send um, about, you know, between 250 and 300 new emails a week. Um, okay. At the moment, it's a lot less. It's probably if I send 20 a day, that would kind of be max. That's why like, I can't get away with doing um, with doing more personalized, doing video emails and more of them. Um, it's not about the volume at the end. It's about like how many roles can you comfortably work on at any one time. So if I'm supporting, like if I'm, even if I have 15 roles that they think that, that they want me to work on, that's not realistic. Um, as a, I, as a, at the moment, like with the roles that I'm working on, some of them are like, I have a role in Brazil, I have, you know, roles in Asia. Um, it's not about the volume. So if I do a hundred a week, that would be kind of be max. Um, and that's mainly because like I work at the moment, I work alone on, on kind of like some of the senior roles. Uh, when I work as part of the team, it would be like a similar kind of number, but it's together as a team. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because the personification also takes and research. The research takes the longest. So like, you know, I, it's easy to find somebody's LinkedIn profile and, and try to do something on that, but that's not enough. So kind of finding that, what's the hook? Like, you know, did they write an article at some point? Like, who are they following? You know, what meetup group are they in? That kind of research is that obviously amazing hiring makes it easier because you can click on all the social networks that they're part of, which used to take me a lot longer because you, you know, have to copy paste usernames and find things like that and do image search and reverse image search and, you know, all of that. Google getting worse at that. So you start using Yandex because they just have the best image search and things like that. It's just that takes a lot longer. That like the easy win is to use, you know, that you already have that mapping and it's all in one profile. And so it makes it easier for me to kind of do that background research, but that's still the thing that takes the longest. Doing a video and even doing a follow-up video later, that that's the easy piece because I already have the research. So I probably spend 90% of, of the actual preparation to do the research on the people. Um, and then the like, you know, the last 10% is the actual execution of it. So, you know, that's, that's, I mean, the better the research is, the more targeted you can get. And a lot of the times you have to like, look, this candidate doesn't look right. But once you've been over them a couple of times, you're like, I'd rather leave it. Whereas you might have before you might like, oh, they hit the keyword. I'll send them an email anyway. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mark, thank you so much. Uh, I'm afraid it's a time to wrap up. Um, thank you everyone for your questions. I think that's been really, really insightful. Uh, from our end, we will try to, you know, summarize it all in a few 10 bullet points, just the most important things and uh, send over to uh, everyone, probably post in the blog. So um, have a very, very nice Friday, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mark, and uh, hello and love from everyone at Amazing Hiring. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye.